So first, thanks for having me. So the topic is flow label, exploiting IPv6 flow label. And I've said many buzzwords such as flow label and IPv6 and flow label. And so we begin with a short introduction and background. So hopefully everybody would feel okay with what is flow label and IPv6. And if you have any questions, so feel free to interrupt me at any moment and just ask. Okay, so a bit of history and introduction for IPv6. So IPv6 is the latest IPv IP protocol, uh, version 6, and it was introduced in 1998, which seems uh, very long ago, but uh, its internet standard, the, the last stamp of being the latest IP protocol, so it became an uh, internet standard just in 2017, and it, and it has seen many changes since then. Uh, but the question that one might ask is, why should we use the latest IP protocol if IPv4 works so good and everyone is happy? So I would say that IPv4 is not working so good and not everybody is happy. And one of the main catalysts towards the transition to IPv6 is that IPv4 address pool has run out. And what do I mean by IPv4 address pool has run out? So it's not that we don't have uh, IPv IPv4 addresses anymore, but the original registers, the rears, so every continent has the original register. For instance, in Europe, it is right. So they allocate the IPv4 addresses uh, to the ISPs. So we get our IPv4 address from our ISP, and our ISP gets its IPv4 address pool from the regional internet registries. So their pool has run out. So they have already allocated all their IPv4 addresses to the ISPs. So it's not that there are no IPv4 addresses in the world, but it's now only the ISPs hands. So this is a major catalyst towards the transition to IPv6. Uh, and, it always, and it has already begun, and we're talking about 30% worldwide adoption. And we can see here in the map, and the, there are even some countries with 50% IPv6 connectivity. And this number is increasing, and we'll probably switch uh, to IPv6 soon. And if we have time to talk about uh, the local situation in Israel, so when we started this research, uh, the only ISP that provided IPv6 by default was Xphone, and we had to connect to Xphone as an ISP. Uh, but now Hotnet also provides IPv6, and I've read that uh, by July 2021, uh, they, they should provide IPv6 by default to all their clients. And I've checked the IPv6 connectivity in Israel, and it now shows 10%, which is quite good. Because when we started the, the research, it was less than 1% or 1%. So IPv6 is adopted, and we see that the world goes towards adoption. And uh, the most important point here is that all modern operating systems support IPv6. And furthermore, if a server supports both IPv6 and IPv4, so IPv6 would be preferred over IPv4. So it means that a user might be using IPv6 unknowingly uh, without even knowing that he uses IPv6 uh, under the hood. Okay, so let's talk about the IPv6 address size. So we say that the IPv4 address pool has run out, and the, the reason is that IPv4 addresses are just 32 bits, and IPv6, uh, as opposed to IPv4, uses 128 bits addresses, and the addresses are uh, split into two parts or consists of two parts, and the first part is the 64 bits network prefix, which shown here, and this is the uh, it's usually used for routing, so you get it from the ISP uh, or so, some sort get it off from your ISP, and it is used for routing, and the user has no control over these 64 bits of network prefix. So you can think of it, if we do an analogy to IPv4, so you can think of it like of your subnet. For example, if your IPv4 is 192.168, so this is something you cannot control. And here also the 64 bits is something you get from your ISP and they're called the network prefix and they're used for routing. And the lower 64 bits are called the interface identifier as shown here. And these 64 bits are controlled by the client. So the client generates this 64 bits interface identifier and together with the 64 bits network prefix, it creates the 128 bit address. Okay. So IPv6 temporary addresses. Uh, this is a privacy extension mechanism of IPv6, and it is implemented and used by default by all major operating systems. And what is the idea of this temporary address 
privacy extension mechanism. So if, for example, an IPv6 address, uh, we use our IPv6 address and it doesn't change. For instance, uh, I generate, as we, we could have seen in the previous slide, so if I generate my interface identifier, and I told you that the network prefix kept un is, is unchanged, so we keep on using the same network prefix. So if my interface identifier uh, is not being changed over time, so everyone can track my machine or my computer because it sees the same interface identifier. So it's, it can track me by my IP, so sorry. So uh, in order to prevent this tracking by just tracking our IP address, uh, so this privacy extension mechanism was introduced. And the idea is to change our IPv6 address over time. So the idea is to present temporary addresses, which would be used for outbound connections and will be regenerated periodically. And usually this period of time is 24 hours. So every 24 hours, the client generates a new interface identifier. And the result is a temporary IPv6 address, which is used for outbound connections. So every 24 hours, I have a new interface identifier, which should be generated uh, randomly, or it should be look uniform. So no one could track my IPv6 address. So every 24 hour, hours, I change my IPv6 address to prevent tracking uh, my computer merely by my IPv6 address. OK. So let's see IPv6 versus IPv4 headers. So here we can see the IPv6 uh, 16 header, which has a constant size of 40 bytes. And you can see that many uh, fields from the IPv4 header, uh, which doesn't have a constant size, and its size varies between 20 to 60 bytes, according to the optional headers, uh, optional fields. So you can see that many of these optional fields were removed from the IPv6 header, and they moved to the what's called IPv6 extension headers, and they're not part of the default traffic. So if I surf uh, with using IPv6, if I surf to Google, so I assume this is the IPv6 header that Google would see. And extension headers uh, exist, but they're not part of the default communication using IPv6. So you can see that IPv6 header is 16. And some of the headers are the same with just their name changed. For example, TTL is now called hop limit in IPv6. But in addition to some name changes and removing headers, uh, removing fields, so they've also introduced some new fields. And one of them is the field called flow label, which is a new 20-bit field that was introduced in IPv6. And this is the main topic of our talk. OK, so what is flow and the a little bit about application? That. Yes, question? Can you explain a little bit about the uh, flags and? About the flags of? IPv4, no, no, IPv6. What attributes, what, are, what do we see? What? What are we seeing here? OK, so this is the IPv4 header, which I assume many uh, are familiar with, but maybe I'm wrong. So there is the version here, uh, type of service, which is quality of service headers, identification, which is the IP ID. Uh, I think that Amit Klein showed, uh, presented uh, an article about the IP ID. Uh, several flag, fragmentation offsets, header checksum, uh, the protocol which is underneath IP, the IP header which is, for example, UDP or TCP. TTL is the time to leave, so every intermediate node uh, decreases this number by one. The source IP, destination IP, and optional headers. In IPv6, in IPv6 so we have the hop limit, which is the TTL, uh, the payload length. Uh, source IP destination IP version here would be six, and new introduced headers, which are uh, new introduced fields, which are the traffic class and flow label. This is the main work uh, we did about the flow label, 20 bit new header, new field. And I will soon explain a bit about flow and what is the flow label. I hope it answers your question. Okay. Okay, if, if you want to ask something specific, so I'll be glad to answer it. OK, so let's talk a bit about what is flow classification and how it connects with this new field called flow label. So a flow is defined as a sequence of packets sent from a particular source to a particular destination. And this flow classification is usually done by flow classifiers, which are usually routers or network distributors uh, that would like to classify our flow in order to uh, route the, the packets in a clever way. So the traditional flow classification is usually done by uh, taking this 
fields, which are the source address, destination address, source port, destination port, and protocol type, also known as protocol number, which is the number of the protocol beneath the IP header. For example, UDP 17, and TCP, and the other numbers. But the problem with this, uh, also, I, I would like to note that these five headers, five fields, are also known as the traditional five tuple. So if I say the traditional five tuple, I mean the source address, destination address, source port, destination port, and protocol type. This is also called the traditional five tuple because this is the traditional uh, field that were used for the flow classification. And the problem is that it might be problematic uh, to use all of these fields due to encryption or fragmentation. For example, in encryption, when we encrypt uh, our traffic, so uh, the flow classifiers, the intermediate nodes, such as routers or network distributors, are not aware of the source port or destination port, which are part of the TCP or UDP packets that are below the IP, the, the IP uh, header. So it might be problematic. And also, if we use IPv4, it might be inefficient because IPv4 does not have a constant size header. So the router needs to extract uh, this field. So it might be problematic too. So IPv6 uh, introduced this flow label that together with the source address and destination address should provide an efficient flow classification to these flow, class flow classifiers. So the idea is that routers and network distributors will take this flow label value together with the source address and destination address. And together, they could uh, derive an efficient flow classification algorithm and classify flows of, uh, of devices. So there are some requirements that uh, we would like the flow label uh, to have. So the requirements are, it is as the RFC states, that it is desirable the flow label values should be uniformly distributed. And it recommends to use a hash function, which is based on the traditional five tuple. I remind you that the traditional five tuple is just the source address, destination address, source port, destination port, and protocol type. So using a hash function, which is based on the traditional five tuple as an input, or a pseudo-random number generator, uh, to assign the flow label values. So the RFC recommends to use either a hash function or a pseudo-random number generator to assure that the flow label values uh, would look uniform, uniform distributed. And the important uh, observation is that starting with Windows 10 version 17.03 and Linux kernel 4.3, so the default behavior is to generate a non-zero flow label value which actually means that these versions of uh, operating systems actually implement the flow label generation logic. So flow label of zero means that they don't implement this logic, but these versions implement a non-zero flow label value, which means they implement a flow label generation logic. Okay, so how is this flow label generation logic works? Uh, so in Windows, they use a hash function for both TCP and UDP. And in Linux, uh, they do here some things, uh, something a bit different. So for TCP, they use a PRNG. And for status protocols, such as ICMP or UDP, they use a hash function. I know that for uh, Windows, they, for ICMP, they don't implement flow label. So Linux implements flow label also for stateless protocols, such as ICMP, and Windows also only for TCP and UDP. OK, is there a question, Hanan? Okay, so let's begin with Windows. So Windows uses a hash function. So in order to understand what is the logic behind it, so we reverse engineered the TCP IP driver of Windows, and we found out that the algorithm for the flow level generation logic is based on using a toplitz hash uh, with an input of the destination address, sorry, the destination address, source address, destination port, and source port. Uh, well, it's Linux, it's Windows. So the algorithm is based on hashing the destination address, source address, destination port, and the source port, which is part of the traditional five tuple. And as I mentioned, it, they use a toplitz hash, which, is, which has an output of 32 bits. They use a static key. We'll soon talk about it uh, a bit more. So we have here a key, which is a 320 bits key. And this output, which is 32 bits, should be then truncated to feed the 20 bits of the flow label. So I repeat again, uh, Windows uses toplitz hash. The input for the hash is part of the five tuple. This is the destination address, source address, destination port, and source port. And also a 320-bit key, K, 
And all of this output, which is 32 bits, is then truncated to feed the 20 bits of the flow rate. So a bit more about this key. So this key K is a 320-bit pseudo-random static key. This is very important to mention it. It is a static key. And what do I mean by static key? So this key is regenerated only on system reboot. And that in Windows 10, I want to mention that reboot does not equal shutdown in startup. So in Windows 10, if you shut down your computer, uh, there is a feature called fast startup. And actually, when you shut down your computer, uh, it's a bit similar to doing sleep or hibernate. So all the kernel is saved to the disk. And when you start up your machine, it loads the kernel from the disk in order to assure your computer will start up fast. So reboot does not equal shutdown in startup. So if in Windows 10 you shut, up, you shut down your computer and then start it, so you would have the same key. So only reboot causes this key regeneration. So all of, uh, all of the time uh, your computer runs without a reboot, so you would have the same static key in order to generate uh, the flow label values. Another important observation is that this top list hash is a bilinear function, and it is defined as follows. This is XOR, I is the input, and when we use this expression here, we mean the i bit. So this is XOR, and you can think of this dot product as an end or a multiplication uh, under GF2. Okay, questions? Great. Can you so say let's something about the hash function, actually? What is top lit hash function? Yeah, we we will it? see it uh, in, the, in the attack part. We will see exactly how this top lit hash uh, can be expressed a bit more uh, nicely. So we will see exactly how it works. But the idea here is that it is a bilinear. And we will see how to exploit it. OK. I, I hope it will be clear in the, in the next slides. OK, so we proceed with Linux and Android. And in Linux and Android, uh, as I mentioned, there is also a PRNG and also a hash function. As the RFC recommends, you can use either a PRNG or a hash function, and they decided to use both. And we focus on the hash function, which is for the stateless protocols, which are ICMP and UDP, for example. So for TCP, it's a PRNG, and we focused on the stateless protocols. So how it works on Linux? So on Linux, it works as follows. Uh, it's again a hash function, as I mentioned. And the algorithm is based on hashing the five tuple, the traditional five tuple. It doesn't use it uh, explicitly or use it as is. It uses uh, some sort of variation over the hash input. So you can think of the hash input uh, as uh, some function that is based on this traditional five tuple. So they don't take the traditional five tuple as is as, as an input. Uh, they create some sort of a different hash input, which is based on the traditional five tuple. And for several kernels, uh, there is also an additional uh, deterministic uh, behavior, which is doing a roll 32 on part of the result from this hash function. Uh, it is not so interesting. Uh, important notes here is that the hash function is the Jenkins hash function, and the key K is a 32 bit pseudo random static key. And the output of the hash function is again 32 bits, so it needs to be truncated here into feed the 20 bits of the flow rate. So the important observations here, again, that we have here a key, K, which is a 32-bit pseudo-random static key. And again, it means that this key would be regenerated only on system reboot. Uh, but I mentioned that in Linux, if you do shutdown and startup, it's like reboot. So unlike Windows, if you shut down your computer and start it up, uh, it would be the same as reboot, and uh, you would have a new key. But unless a reboot or a shutdown occurred, so you would have the same static key. And this is an important observation uh, that we have a static key. And you can think of your phone, which is an Android. This fits also for Linux and Android. So usually phones are not restarted or shut down too often. So you may think of uh, exploiting an Android phone. So again, we have here a 32-bit pseudo-random static key. OK, this is the detailed algorithm. If somebody is interested in how exactly uh, Linux uses the five tuple to generate uh, the hash result uh, or the flow label, uh, we, it is more detailed in our article. Uh, it doesn't matter too much. We will see soon that everything here is deterministic, and we could uh, you do the same. But we will see it uh, in a few slides. OK, so let's see what is the attack concept. So based on the cryptanalysis of the flow label generation algorithms that we have just seen, 
we saw that the hash input values are integral observable values. And I remind you that the hash input were just the traditional five tuple, or almost the traditional five tuple. So for Windows, it was the source address, destination address, source port, and destination port. And for Linux, they use a variation of the traditional five tuple, but again, it is based on the traditional five tuple, which is an attacker observable value. So the attacker knows what is the source address, destination address, source port, destination port of a specific packet. And for both Windows, for TCP and UDP, and for stateless protocols in Linux and Android, the flow label generation algorithms are based on a static to the random key. I stress it again, it is a static to the random key. And for Linux and Android, uh, the device ID, which we would use for tracking, would be this 32-bit hash key. Okay, so you can think of this hash key as some sort of a seed that if we can extract this seed, we can use this seed uh, as a device ID. So our device ID would be the 32-bit hash key, the static key for Linux and Android. And for Windows, the device ID, the device ID would be part of the 320-bit hash key. We won't use this, the whole hash key, but we would use part of the hash key or a seed. Uh, so if we would be able to extract part of it, it could be used as a device ID. And another important observation regarding this key or device ID or seed, if you might think, is only regenerated at OS startup. So, and for Windows only at restart. So it's even worse for Windows and good for us. So we will have the same device ID across browsers, including privacy modes, incognito and such, network switches, regardless of the privacy extension mechanism that we mentioned, the temporary address, because this device ID or hash key is something that is underlined uh, under the OS. So the operating system uses the same key and it's indifferent if we use Chrome or Firefox, it's the same because it's the same key, okay? So we are not affected by browsers or privacy modes, incognito, network switches, temporary address renewal, it will use the same key. And uh, the key uh, is the same key as long as reboot hasn't occurred. And this makes it perfect for device tracking. And more interestingly, uh, more interestingly, we would see that this attack concept also allow us to carry passive tracking. So we will see in a few more slides that we can also just inspect the packets passively and derive this device ID or key extraction or seed extraction uh, by just passively inspecting packets. Okay, so uh, sort of a sum up. So let's sum it up, our attack concept. So by crypt analysis, the flow label generation algorithms, we got that the algorithm used uh, attacker observable values as in a hash input. So the hash input is based on attacker observable values. The hash keys are constant, which are what I mentioned, they are static. And they're only regenerated at OS startup. And for Windows, only at restart. And by combining these two observations, we can generate a device ID, which is based on this hash key. So this is the attack concept. Okay, so let's see our first attacker. Uh, this is an active attacker. And the active attacker uh, is based on an HTML snippet, which can be embedded by any third party site. And it works as follows. So the snippet forces the target browser to send TCP or UDP traffic according to the target device's device OS. So for, win, for Windows, we could uh, emit also TCP and UDP traffic. And for Linux, only UDP traffic because uh, we focused on the UDP hash function that is relevant only for UDP traffic. So you can see here that uh, our device requests tracking snippet, HTML trigger, and then trigger traffic. And I mentioned again that this generated device ID which is based on the hash key is consistent regardless of the browser use, network changes, or temporary address renewals. And each tracking server may use also a different IP address because that, it doesn't matter. So uh, we're, we're not required the, the server to use a specific IP address. So our, our tracking server can use any IPv6 address he likes. And we would soon see how to choose uh, this IPv6 address, but it can be arbitrary. And the device ID generation uh, or the key extraction requires only three packets for Linux and Android or five packets for the Windows case in UDP. 
And for TCP, for Windows, uh, it requires only nine packets to extract a good device ID or enough key bits in order to track devices. So let's build the attack. And we will start with the active attacker scenario for the UDP case. Uh, so recall the Windows 12 label generation. And I mentioned that it is based on the bilinear toplet hash, which is defined as follows. So here, this is the simplification of uh, this expression here, which is the toplet hash. So the first bit of the toplet hash is as follows, where i is i uh, position zero. It's the first bit of the input for the toplet hash. And I remind you that the input uh, for the toplet hash in the flow label generation algorithm it is the source address, destination address, uh, source port, destination port. So this is the input, and the zero. Uh, the input at the zero position, so it is the, the first bit of the input. Okay, so this is the simplification of the top list hashes and expression, and this is the XOR that I mentioned, and this is can be thought as an end or a multiplication under GF2. Okay, uh, so the input uh, is limited to be 298 uh, bits, uh, so for our specific input, it is 288 bits, and the key is always 320 bits. So you can see here the key uh, here is key uh, position zero, and for the 31st bit, it is the 31st bit of the key. Okay. So uh, because the toplet hash is bilinear, we have specific traits that holds, and one of these uh, specific traits is that if we take some i1 and uh, two equal size i1 and i2, which are equal size, and we store their toplet hash, we will get the following result. So toplet hash of the first input, XOR toplet hash of the second input using the same key K is like doing toplet hash using the same key K and XORing the inputs. So instead of doing this, we could have done this. Okay, so this is the same. And here we can see why it holds by the definition of the toplet hash. So we just write it like this, and we can see that we can take here the XOR together, and we get that this expression is the same as this one. Okay, and another question is what happens if we set the XOR of these inputs to be one followed by zeros or just single bit on and all the others are zeros? So by the definition of the toplet hash, uh, this toplet hash of XOR of the inputs is the same of this result because we define the XOR of the inputs to be one followed by zeros. So toplet hash of this and, and toplet hash of this is the same as toplet hash of the XOR which we define to be one followed by zeros. And by definition, uh, this is how toplets uh, hash works. So we get the, the 32 bits of the key. And this also follows from the definition, because if we put here one, then followed by zero, so we get XOR with zero. And so we get one multiplied by K the zero position and so on. So we actually got the key. This follows from the definition of the toplets hash. Again, we, we assume the same key is being used. And this is actually a trivial leak. Okay, so we actually were able to uh, leak bits of the key with a specific input. So this is, would be our main idea uh, on how leaking uh, bits of the key. So let's see how to build the attack. So for the UDP case, recall that the flow label is just a top list hash of specific parameters that are part from the traditional flag tuple using a, a specific key K. And it's been truncated to fit the 20 bits. And the idea would be as follows. The destination address, source address, destination port, and source port, which are the input for this hash function, are known to the tracker because the tracker can see uh, from the packets and see that the destination address, which he knows, the source address, destination port, and source port. And the idea would be that if we could sort two flow label values uh, to achieve a single one followed by zeros, so we could achieve a trivial key leak on the slide that we see from the previous slide that we saw that if we have one followed by zeros, we achieve a trivial key leak. So the idea here would be the same, to somehow affect the input, so the XOR of two flow level values, which are actually XOR of two toplet hashes, would be somehow uh, one followed by zeros. So this requires that the XOR of the destination address, source address, destination port, and source port should result in a single one bit. So let's start breaking it up uh, into parts. So let's begin with the source address. So the source of two source addresses would usually be zero. 
And the reason is that usually our computer uses a single IPv6 address. So if we see two packets, we can assume that these two packets were originated from the same source address. So the XOR of two source addresses would usually be zero. Okay, this is good. If we use a specific uh, protocol, which is called WebRTC, which is a protocol to emit UDP traffic from browsers. So when using WebRTC, it is possible to call the target to emit multiple packets to any destination address we wish and any destination port. However, it uses the same source port to emit this traffic. So if it uses the same source port and we emit multiple packets, and these multiple packets originate from the same source port, so the XOR of the source ports would also be zero because this is the same source port. Okay, so this leaves us with the destination address and destination port, but they are controlled by the tracker. So the tracker can control the lower 64 bits of the destination address, which are the interface identifier, and the 60-bit destination port uh, in order to achieve a trivial key lift. So he might choose his destination address in a specific manner using the same destination port, for instance, and achieve a trivial key leak, and then repeat it uh, with different choice of destination addresses. And we show that we can, uh, res it, it results in a device ID that consists of more than 80 key bits. So we derive the device ID that has more than 80 key bits, and this would be our device ID that is actually key bits of the hash, of the hash function. And I also would like to note that this method is independent of the source address and source port. As we mentioned, the source address, we assumed it is the same source address. So we don't care what is the source address. And by using WebRTC, we cause the source port also to be the same. So it doesn't care also about the source port. And it, is, and it means that this method is independent of these uh, fields. And it allows us to track users also over VPN. So we actually tested it uh, over VPNs and we saw that also over VPN it's possible to track uh, clients using this method, specific UDP case method. Okay, so this is the UDP case method using WebRTC. So now what about generic cases? When the source address uh, is not the same or we have multiple source addresses or the source port is not the same, etc. So for generic cases, the tracker can exploit the linearity of the top lit hash. So we know that the top lit hash is a bilinear function. So we can use linear equations over the flow label values. And uh, the destination address, source address, destination port, source port are known to the tracker. So it allows us to yield linear equations. And once we solve this linear equation, equation so the solution would be the key bits uh, that were used to generate the flow label values. And these bits would be used then as a device ID. And we actually showed that uh, by a specific choice of the destination address, we are able to derive an 80-bit device ID uh, by just uh, triggering nine TCP packets. And again, I mentioned that it requires a specific choice of the 64 least significant bits of the destination addresses. Uh, and with just nine packets, it is possible to yield linear equations that would result in 80-bit device ID. OK, so we finished with Windows. Uh, unless anyone has some questions. So this was the Windows part. And we now move to the Linux and Android part. And this is, again, a reminder on how Linux and Android uh, generate the flow label values. And I remind you that the flow label generation algorithm is based on the traditional pipe tuple uh, using a, the Jenkins hash function uh, and some uh, deterministic uh, operations according to the kernel version. But can the important you, observation here, yes. Can you just remind the sizes of the, the input and output? Yeah. So, okay, so, so the hash input, uh, it varies uh, according to the kernel version. It doesn't really matter once we know the kernel version, so we can know exactly what is the hash input, uh, but it varies according to the version. Uh, regarding the hash function, so the hash function output is 32 bits. The K is also 32 bits. We will soon talk about it more. And because it is a 32-bit uh, result, so up, also after roll 32, it's still 32 bits, and then needs to be truncated to fit the 20 bits of the flow label. Uh, so again, I remind that the key size is just 32 bits, and all the other uh, operations here were deterministic. Uh, so there is no need to analyze the hash function at all. We could just enumerate over all possible keys and extract the correct key. We will soon see how. 
Okay, any more questions, Bilal? Uh, Did it answer? I hope this. Yeah, it's okay. Okay, great. So let's see how we exploit Linux and Android logic. So if we use WebRTC again to trigger UDP traffic, uh, we use for this case WebRTC not because we want the behavior of the same source port, we just in order to trigger UDP traffic from the browser. Okay, so this is the reason we use here WebRTC, unlike in Windows that we also uh, benefited from the same source port. So we use WebRTC to trigger UDP traffic from the target device browser. And uh, our tracking server is aware of the traditional file tuple and they are known to the tracker. So the tracker just enumerates over all the 32-bit pseudo-random uh, hash key possibilities in order to find the correct key. And once this correct key is found, so we can use these 32 bits as a device ID. And I remind you that because the flow label is a 20-bit truncation, that we need at least two packets in order to assure that we got the correct device ID. So by just two packets or three packets in order to be on the safe side, uh, we can assure that we extract the correct key uh, with a good probability and we can use it as a device set. Okay, so as I promised, there is also another uh, attacker model, which is the passive attacker, and it works as follows. So in this, uh, in this attack model, so we can might think of two possibilities. One possibility is a server, which doesn't use any HTML snippet, it just inspects uh, the regular traffic, the connection traffic from the client. So it just inspects it, nothing active here. Or an if dropping man in the middle or forwarding node scenario, which we have here uh, man in the middle or intermediate node that it just uh, has if dropping abilities. And it just inspects IPv6 brackets that uh, moves, to, uh, moves from, uh, from the target to the internet and we are just in the middle. So in these scenarios, it is also possible to generate a device ID, and it is possible by just passively inspecting the device's IPv6 traffic. Okay, and again, because uh, our device ID is based uh, on the hash key, so the generated device ID is consistent, and again, no effect of the browser use, network changes, temporary address renewal, because we extract the key. Uh, and another interesting uh, um, Something interesting that it's a, actually a side effect of it, that if we have any state actor or ISP or CDN that somehow logged IPv6 traffic of devices somehow, somewhere in the past, so they can retroactively correlate devices and their activity. So uh, a bit uh, terrifying, I would say. So let's see how it works from the bird's eye view. So we can collect IPv6 traffic or just inspect our previous collected traffic, as we mentioned. And for Windows, for TCP and UDP, we'll just yield equations over the key bits, exactly as we've done in the generic case. We know the parameters, uh, part of the five tuple. And so we'll just uh, yield equations, and we would use the extracted key bits as a device ID. And for Linux and Android, uh, it works only for stateless protocols. And we can extract the 32-bit key again by enumeration, exactly the same as we've, as we've done uh, in the previous slides. And we can just uh, inspect the sample IPv6 traffic and enumerate over the possibilities of the key and extract the key. And the important point here is that there is no need uh, for traffic manipulation or intervention, or intervention, and there is no need for spatial malicious tra crafted IPv6 packets. So, this scenario assumes that no one uh, intervened, manipulated, or caused specific IPv6 packets to be emitted from the target. We just sit there and inspect traffic or previously inspected traffic without any intervention in the traffic or causing uh, specially crafted uh, emission of traffic. Okay, so the affected platforms of uh, this attack, so Windows 10 1703 till Windows 10 1903, including all of the versions, uh, were vulnerable. And after our report, so they fixed it in the November 2019 security update. Uh, I note that Windows 10 1703 was not fixed because it was outdated at the time. And for the Linux kernels, uh, 4.3 till 5.3.9 are vulnerable. And the solution, uh, at least something we have seen that they've done, is to 
change the Jenkins hash function, which uses a 32-bit uh, key, to, a, to zip hash, uh, which uses a 128-bit key. So we cannot enumerate over this. OK, so let's conclude. Uh, both Windows, TCP and UDP, and Linux and Android for the stateless protocols can be tracked by just inspecting IPv6 flow label values, either by active packet triggering or by just passive inspection. And we tested this successfully over 19 different networks worldwide, and also including VPNs. So VPNs are also vulnerable. Uh, and we would like to mention that attacker observable values, even if the values themselves are not security sensitive, because one might ask, OK, the flow label, just uniform numbers, it just sit there. What could go wrong? Uh, so we've just seen that uh, this benign field called flow label uh, can be uh, exploited by attackers. So attacker observable values might cause a security and privacy concern. And this is a generic recommendation always use industrial strength crypto together with an educated key size because bad things can happen if not and if we have time i would show a short demo uh, it might be a bit loud so get ready to uh, to lower the volume you share okay do you see my screen yes yeah. so. yeah. wait i need to press share computer sound okay What you've just seen, it's a Windows device that uh, served also from uh, Chrome, also from Chrome Incognito and Firefox, and got the same device ID. And uh, that's it. Thank you. Questions? Thank you. Um, um, any questions? <laughs> So what about Mac? Mac uses uh, Linux? So oh, Mac. OK, so Mac algorithm is a bit similar to Linux. Uh, however, their input is not only based on the traditional pipe tuple. They also use uh, additional 64 bit of randomness. And uh, it's not so simple. <laughs> so we could not use the same attack that we used for Linux. So we, we might think that Mac is secure, but uh, we haven't verified it too much. <laughs> I see. OK. Okay, any, any other question? So let's thank uh, Jonathan again, Jonathan. And um, we have a meeting less, next week also with uh, Roy Schuster from Cornell Tech. So see you next week, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.